All right, so not, no democracy here, really, to speak of in the 18th century. But just because there was no democracy didn't mean that there weren't institutions that could be used for democratic purposes. Any guess as to what type of institutions may have existed in the 18th century that could have been used for democratic purposes? Even if they don't believe in this idea of democracy. Any places, sort of places in, 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 in cities or in towns that could be forums for people to talk about things that we might look back on and say, that's kind of democratic looking. Where do we, okay. A tavern. A tavern. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. A central place. Why a tavern? Because everyone like, comes to taverns, like, be like, sort of like a town hall today. Okay, taverns. Uh, and what, well, we have, they had town halls back then too, which is another one. You've gotten two. <laughs> two. <laughs> What'd you say? I'm pretty cool that way. <laughs> You're pretty cool that way. You are. So you have town halls, and especially in New England uh, uh, areas where there were towns that people got together and congregated and passed local policies that said you can or cannot uh, have your pig or, or, uh, or, or cow graze on this particular plot of land. Those were areas where people at local level were making decisions that affected everyone's daily lives. Now taverns were critical as well. Because at this time, a lot of the water was not particularly sanitary because you had pigs and cows that were uh, leaving waste in that water. So what was the healthiest form of drinking? Beer and alcohol, because alcohol would kill bacteria, right? Now, I'm sure that you can't sell your parents on this argument uh, that this is, in fact, what should happen. But at the time, uh, taverns were a central part of life because it was a central a form of drinking and consumption. And it was a place where people got together and they talked and they shared ideas. There's a reason why, and it's been argued even by some historians, that the American Revolution, where was it born? Where were the ideas of rebellion and, and taking on the king and eventually eliminating connections with the king? They were born in taverns in Boston where people like Sam Adams, who now has a beer named after him, <coughs> Got together and said, "We want, right? We want to, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't believe that everything that's taking place here is protecting our rights, right? Now, what is it about a tavern? What is it about a tavern that might allow for a more free discussion? What's that? <laughs> Al well, alcohol certainly might help, but what else?" Yeah, nobody's there sort of saying, okay, here's the topic that we're allowed to talk about today and here's what we're not allowed to talk about today. Conversation can be free-flowing, right? It's not like a church and where, you have, where you have a priest or a minister who might sort of set the forum. It's not like a town hall where you might have particular parliamentary procedures that are setting things out. <clears throat> Taverns at the time were also places where information was exchanged. And if we're continuing on in some of these lists of, of institutions that might be used to facilitate democracy, one of them was newspapers. The first newspaper in North America was created around 1703 in Boston. And newspapers, again, not being able to be controlled, or at least not very effectively controlled, by government officials, allowed for a freer flow of ideas. And especially in New England towns, in which large numbers of people could read, newspapers became a forum for discussion, a forum for debate. 
So we've got newspapers, we've got town halls, we've got taverns. I thought taverns would be the one that people didn't get. You got it immediately. What are some other institutions during the colonial period that could be used for democratic purposes? The village green, the sort of common area where people would often congregate to have to hear uh, uh, discussions or, or, or sort of campaigns for local officials that were running for office. Uh, let's go here. Churches. Churches. Absolutely. A place that was, to a great extent, outside of politics, in which people talked and discussed the meaning of life, and also talked and discussed how politics affected their lives. Churches are absolutely central. Yeah. Masonic lodges. Masonic lodges. <clears throat> Though uh, the argument could and often was made in subsequent years that Masonic lodges uh, for Freemasonry, which came sort of emerged out of England, and, and many of the founding fathers, including George Washington, were Freemasons. The argument was often made that how are these really democratic, right? They're not necessarily democratic because they're secret. They happen in secret, and they're 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 only a, a select few can really participate in them. But you're right in that these types of institutions are places, again, in which people can get together and if they want, complain about government. Right? <coughs> Another institution that had <coughs> growing importance in the colonial period were libraries. Benjamin Franklin formed <coughs> one of the first free libraries in Philadelphia the Library Company of Philadelphia. Again, a place in, where books, in which books could be centralized and people could read. Because it really is true, right, that knowledge is power. And that's, in fact, why I commend you for being here, this, the, you know, taking a week out of your summer here to try to learn more uh, about these things. Because these types of, uh, of discussions uh, allow people access to information. Now, in the colonial period, I'm not suggesting that any of these institutions necessarily led to democracy. And certainly not an American form of it. Because as I said, the colonists didn't think of themselves as Americans, right, until after the American Revolution. <coughs> Most of the information that was printed in newspapers tended to support the idea of the British monarchy. <coughs> Local governments and town halls perceived themselves as part of the British Empire. And as a rule, churches did not necessarily want individuals declaring themselves independent or disconnected from their communities or, from, or, or necessarily want to overturn the political system. <coughs> in the South, in particular, democracy had a negative connotation because slaveholders were concerned that democracy might insinuate that there was something wrong with their race-based system of slavery. <clears throat> now, all of these institutions, however, when the perception was that the British government was violating colonist rights as Englishmen, was taxing them without representing them, was putting armies within their midst and quartering them in colonist homes, was in essence acting tyrannical. All of these institutions could and were then mobilized to ultimately lead the American colonies towards independence. <clears throat> Yet even American revolutionaries, most of them, at least the elite leaders of them, George Washington, even Thomas Jefferson at this time, John Adams and others were not arguing for democracy, but instead for republicanism. And I mean the small r republicanism. Again, separate yourself from sort of Bill Clinton and George Bush. We're talking small r republicanism. And what is the difference? This is a tough one. This is the tough question. After this, it gets easier. What is the difference between and democratic understandings of government and republican understandings of government? 